All right, we got S.A. Griffin with us. S.A., thank you so much for uh, for joining us. The reason sure. I, I I had you on here is um, we did an episode with Jerry on poetry, and it's it's a subject I'm not super well versed in, but I, I have a, a respect, I admire it. And uh, during the session, you talked about this this moment. This some people call it a eureka moment. Some people call it a, a a moment where you know everything just clicks into place singularity and it was when you you heard this poem invictus by william ernest henley right yes. tell us a, a little bit about that well that was um <clears throat> um to give it some background um i come from a pretty uh a pretty uh tough background uh, my stepfather and my mother were both alcoholics. I'm the oldest of six. I grew up the oldest of five. Didn't know I had a sixth uh, sibling until, um, or a fifth sibling to round out the six, until I was in college and didn't find them until about, oh, about 16, 17 years ago. But um, anyway, backing up to the other stuff. So I grew up uh, primarily in the projects in Richmond, California. And, um, and I was kind of left in charge of my siblings by the time I was about 11, 12 years old because my parents were gone all the time. My stepfather was an alcoholic uh, truck driver from Nashville, Tennessee. He was a pure, pure to the bone redneck. He lived to uh, basically, uh, I don't know what I can get away with saying here, but I'll, I'll be nice. For having sex, drinking and fighting, mm -hmm. and, uh, not in, in, in no particular order. And so we grew up with a lot, all, all the textbook abuse. And I had a brother and sister who, had, who were misdiagnosed as mentally retarded. Uh, now since um, I've learned that basically the autism spectrum disorders run in my family. Um, and so, uh, and um, so anyway, a lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it was a struggle. You know, it was a struggle to kind of um, kind of filter through all that. So anyway, um, we moved out of Richmond and when I was in junior high school, and we moved uh, to another part of the East Bay, San Francisco East Bay, in San Leandro, and I started going to Barrett Junior High School. And at Barrett Junior High School, um, my English teacher, Mr. Bates, for extra credit, would assign us poems. And up until that point, the majority of poetry that I've been exposed to would be like, Dr. Seuss. Fortunately for my generation, I'm going to be 68 years old. Dr. Seuss, uh, he was there for his, I think it was first published when I was like four or five years old. And, and Dr. Seuss is amazing. Yes. Still one of the greatest poets I've ever read. You know, and then the and a political poet. cartoonist. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. And I have one of, his, one of those books here. And so um, anyway, um, and the other poetry that I would have been exposed to, song lyrics, you know, yeah. you know, theology, the things in general that were Hallmark cards, but not directly the way that Mr. Bates was doing it. So a buddy of mine, Rick Herndon and I, we'd have a private, we had a private com co competition going on. He always, he always beat the hell out of me. He was always better than me, which really pissed me off, but it didn't stop me. So we- And his up, ability to, to basically, recite poetry. Yeah, recite, the, recite yeah, yeah. the poem, not just memorize it, but make sense out of it and make it compelling to listen to and, you know, um, so, but anyway, and he really did. He always just, he just put my old dick in the dirt. <laughs> so uh, so uh, anyway, uh, we had memorized stuff like If by Rudyard Kipling, which is an important poem to me. Uh, Annabelle Lee, you know, by Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, on down the line, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's 43rd Sonnet from the Portuguese, which is, I think, probably the greatest love poem ever written. You know, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. You know, I mean, it's just amazing. So I was really flipped out and turned on to poetry big time. But this poem, Invictus, changed my life because uh, it, it, yes. I, I was just going to say, before you, you heard Invictus, you were already getting into the world of poetry. Yes, I was already, getting, I was already turned on by the poem. Gotcha. And, and I'd say up until that point, the poem that really, really turned me the most up to that point was If by Rudyard Kipling, which is also a very important poem because of what's embedded in there, you know, don't give up, fight the good fight, uh, you know, uh, be accessible to all people. Not, you know, if you can walk with kings and still have the common touch, et cetera, et cetera. 
So all those ideas embedded in that poem also really turned me on and were propelling me forward. But when I reached Invictus, it actually changed my life because this poem spoke to me directly yes. and told me that I could be the captain of my fate, no matter the fell circumstance, that I could rise above the circumstance and I could better myself and I could move forward as my own person and not be owned by, by somebody else mm -hmm. or, be, or be owned by the circumstance. And so this poem really did change my life and I wouldn't be talking to you today if it wasn't for this poem because through this poem then I continued to further myself and, and really commit myself to poetry and then started really writing poetry my late teens and early 20s and then started publishing a bit later, probably in my mid to late 20s. And I think most of the early stuff I wrote was horrible. And I don't know why you know, they published some of the early stuff, but you know, that's the process. The process as we keep moving forward, we don't, we don't, we don't stand still. We can't, it's impossible to stand yes. still. Yeah, it's yeah. death and satisfaction is death to the creative uh, process. So, I mean, I continue to move forward, hopefully, hopefully moving forward and hopefully improving. It doesn't mean that some of the stuff I did was, was that bad, but most of it's pretty bad. But the point is, is Invictus really brought me here, ultimately taking me to the whole beat generation and all that kind of stuff and the Dadaists and the Futurists and you know all the things that I've really moved me and I've studied and really committed myself to, but, but this poem really, really does it. And this poem is actually, um, actually um, a pretty amazing piece. In 2010, I had a project called The Poetry Bomb and I, it took me years to find it, but I finally found a bomb on Craigslist at midnight, right after midnight. An I actual had, bomb. An actual bomb, yeah. <laughs> With explosives inside of it? Well, we don't know, but, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, it was a, a really, it was a 1970 uh, MK240, 100 pound practice bomb, Navy practice bomb right. from the Vietnam era. It's got dents in it. I left the dents in it. It's actually, uh, it was actually used. And, um, and so uh, I paid a hundred bucks for it. I mean, I, I searched for this sucker for years. Either the hippies got them all, or the go government got them all, but they were gone. And, um, and it was a guy that had, it was a member of the Adventurers Club, which was really cool. They're kind of like, uh, they're a, a club of real people who are real adventurers that have like, you know, conquered the Arctic and the Antarctic and gone to the moon. And these are the adventurers. And they actually wanted me to be a part of the club when they found out what I was doing. Because the guy that I bought the bomb from was the former president of the Adventurers Club. And I did go to a few meetings. I actually took the, when I finished the poetry bomb, I took it to the meeting and shared it with them. But ultimately I, um, I uh, declined their invitation. I just didn't feel that comfortable with the group. And, mm -hmm. and those guys, they were doing things that, you know, walking on the moon i'm never gonna walk on the moon yeah but uh so anyway the poetry bomb um was converted into an art piece took about six months and uh filled it i filled it full of poetry from all over the world all walks of life from all ages like three to 93 every theology ashes of uh of pets ashes of uh, dear friends and family so it's, it's been elevated to my mind a sacred object. And then I uh, planned a uh, five week tour of the entire continental United States. Uh, and I called it the, uh, the uh, couch surf, the poetry bomb couch surfing across America tour of words, because I, I, I like to sleep on couches. So I literally couch surfed across America. I got a few beds, but I did sleep on a lot of couches. That's your inner bard. Yeah, my inner bard. And um, and so uh, everywhere that I would go, I would do the show where I would pull poems out of the inside mm -hmm. of the bomb and read poems that were in the bomb. And then at some point, I would point at the bomb and I'd go, war, the art, artifice, artifact of war, were created to invent and enforce agreements. Hopefully, I created something that will inspire disagreements. If we don't learn to disagree right now, we're screwed. We need to learn to disagree. We've lost the ability to, dis to disagree. All civil discourse, all democratic democratic process uh, depend upon disagreement. And we, dis we do not have the ability to dis disagree any longer. Sadly, since 2010, 
it's just become exponentially worse, which is mind blowing to me. So anyway, Invictus was one of the poems I read everywhere I went. And I'd say half a dozen times, and I think I've read it about, in five weeks, I think I read it about 30 different places. So it was like a rock and roll tour without the rock and roll, uh, you know, the groupies or anything else. And so when I would read the poem, either people would come up afterwards and thank me because the poem had changed their lives or people had been so changed by the poem, they were actually, as I was reading it, they had it memorized and they were reading it with me. So there were a chorus of people in the audience doing it with me when I, and that's a wonderful boy, like reading it out loud as you read out, it with yes. you out, yeah because they how many like, people would you say were i'd say one time i i know i had one guy once i mean he was just out loud he yeah. was just he was just so moved that he was just with me and i think one time i had a couple of people doing it because this poem is universal i mean the um a few years ago there was a movie called invictus and they I think it was, uh, I never saw it, but as I recall, it, it was around soccer and Nelson Mandela. Oh, is it rugby, yeah. And, rugby, yeah. yes, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, I saw that when looking for it after you you had, you had shared it with us, I uh -huh. Googled it and it, it's, it's like the central scene of the film is right. as he's reading it when he visits Nelson Mandela's prison. Uh, which I don't think really happened, but for no. the purposes of the film. It's dramatic, yes. Yes, yes because this poem has touched that many people since it was written. And he wrote it, William Ernest Henley wrote it because he had his, when he was young, he had, because of, I think, tuberculosis. And, um, and so he wrote this for himself really hmm. to uh, basically say that I'm not gonna be conquered by my demons or by, or by the circumstance or anything else. But as all great art does, and I do believe this is great art, it moves people in the way that they need to be moved and how it applies to them personally. And I believe this poem has probably saved more people than, God, I, I've never encountered a poem that's probably moved more people than, than this poem really has. There are many, there are other poems that probably are more, like there's pieces of Shakespeare, every dog has his day, green eyed monster of jealousy and, you know, things that Shakespeare has done that have become part of their ubiquitous in our, and English language cultures. It, they become aphorisms. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But for an entire poem like this, you know what I mean? Um, to and you, re you really do have to hear the poem in its entirety Yeah. for that. I mean, you don't have to, but the first time that you hear it in its entirety, you get that encouragement. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should I read it? Please. Cool. The Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. It's kind of up there with Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. It's pure economy, says all it needs to say, and it moves countless yeah. numbers of people. You know, like... Uh, Douglas Copeland's fanfare for the common oh, man. I love that. Ba -da -da. Yeah. You could have that playing to this almost. Yeah. Da -da -da. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's a, uh, so it's, um, and that's really, I think the bane, the crux and the beauty of all creative endeavors is to do things with economy. The greatest economy has the greatest reward. You know what I mean? And that is so much easier said than done. Yes. That is so much easier said than done. I mean, God almighty, I wish the hell I could, wish I could blow that trombone all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the economy of words, right? Less is more. And, and I've struggled with that as, yeah. as a creative writer. 
well, the economy of all things. If we really could uh, live in genuine economy with genuine economy in all things, we'd probably all be Methuselahs. You know? Ex explain that character to me. Because we would be living our lives as correctly as possible. We'd be living with pure economy. In other words, Balanced. we would not waste anything. We would not be consuming the things that really superfluous sort of things that, that weren't good for us just because we're feeding our hedonistic selves or, or the desire to have sweets in our mouth all the time. Or in other words, we would also be living economically in terms of our, uh, our psychic lives and abilities, our intellectual lives, our spiritual lives. So in other words, if we lived in pure economy on all levels of our being, we probably, we would, uh, the friction would be gone, man. And we would be a rubber tire on the road for, for quite a long time. The, the road would go on forever, as the Alban brothers like to say. Whereas Jack, the forever K, might throw the ball right over the plate. Now, now when, you, <laughs> when you first heard this, this poem, like, yes. tell me about that, that singularity moment of, you know, when you heard it. And then I want to know what, what that poem means to you now. Like, because as a kid, you're telling me that you, you had this, this, for lack of a better word, descriptive word, a, a rather brutal childhood. Yeah, it's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. And then you hear this poem and it's like, like I say, the singularity moment where it just, the stars align and then yeah. it pushes you, it motivates you to, to look at your situation and say, I'm not, I'm going to pull myself out of this, which is easier, okay. which is the most difficult thing in life to do is to pull yourself out of a situation. Right. Well, especially as a child, because you're like a prisoner of uh, real circumstance. And prisoner is kind of the right word in this context, because you don't have a choice. You're yeah. born in your lack born, of control. You're well, you're born into this environment. And um, as awareness creeps over you, you know, by the time you're aware enough to figure out that you want to get the hell out of here, you're really stuck. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? You know, uh, you get to hit the streets and some, some, unfortunately, a lot of children do hit the streets. Yeah. And that's really a very horrible thing because those are the ones, those are the ones that end up as a, as child prostitutes and criminals and, you know, and, um, and addicted to drugs and alcohol and lots of horrible things. You know, um, fortunately I didn't go that way. I, uh, ultimately when I turned 18, I joined the air force and that's another story. Yeah. I mean, I was, uh, I was running as far away as I could. You know, when I was a child, one of the things I wanted to be, and this hit me later in life, I'll get back to the poem in just a second, but I was really obsessed with the space program. And I really, I knew everything about the space program. And I really, I was a real geek. The only time people talked to me when I was a kid was to get answers on the test. Otherwise I was kind of like a pariah. I was just a goofball and a weirdo. And, and, um, and so uh, in, in retrospect, I know exactly why I wanted to be an astronaut because it was as far away from home as I GTFO. Could yeah, man, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. Taking care of business. Bachman Turner Overdrive, baby. So, uh, but, um, uh, but this poem really did. It, it blew my mind. It spoke loud and clear to me and it told me that I needed to start taking control. And I did. A number of other things at the time that I kind of learned to kind of take control of. And so, uh, and there were times when I was about 14, 15 years old, I really didn't think I was going to make it. I thought I was, I really thought I was going to lose my mind because the responsibility, because I wasn't just taking care of, you know, I, there was five of us all together yeah. and I was taking care of two of them were, especially my sister was pretty severely disabled. You know what I mean? And I was taking Whoa, care of him. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. the bartender for my, my mother and my stepfather. I was, uh, I was the cook, you know, because my mother was a terrible cook. And I was, and she was, God bless her. I mean, you know, I do love my mother. I, yes. I have issues with her. But, uh, but I would come home, my, my job, go to school, come home from school, uh, clean, the house, clean the apartment or the house. Uh, peel 10 pounds of potatoes, put the beans on. And every night we had beans and potatoes and fried hamburger. And I, I did the cooking every day, you know, pretty much. Uh, um, so I was doing everything um, uh, that I could possibly do. And 
meanwhile, the other kids are out in the street playing and stuff, you know what I mean? And my, my brother, you're younger than me. I didn't want him to lead the life I led. So I would let him go off, do whatever he wanted, you know? And so there was a time when it really got to me and I didn't think I was going to make it. And of course, then the other, the other sorts of uh, things that you deal with because of such things. And part of his genetic is depression and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think most creatives are probably depressed. <laughs> Especially poets. And yeah. I, I don't mean that in jest. I mean, yeah. poets well, do, there's a history of mental health. Yeah, there is. I think because poetry and poets of all of the arts and poets and writers are kind of in the same boat, of course. Yeah. But poets, especially, uh, one of the things that I, I like to say is a. Uh, Poets uh, don't hide well, they don't know how. You know, and uh, when we get that discussion we had with Jerry about candor, well, that goes right in line with candor. Candor is living very openly, speaking very openly, uh, and creating very openly. Not that most creative people don't, but I think one of the, one of the tasks that we have possibly as a poet, and again, there's no obligation ever, but is to uh, create, speak, live maybe with candor. And, yes. and uh, that can make people difficult if you're really committed to that sort of idea, uh, especially with the poem. You know, as an actor, I take all the hits and I, that's my professional life. And um, I'm kind of paid to do that. Yeah. As a poet, um, that's not the game. I don't, I don't play that game as a poet. You know, I say that... Uh, uh, acting is always my business. Sometimes it's my art. Poetry is always my art. Sometimes right. it's my business. Now, it sounds like comedians, uh, like a true comedian. And 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 I'm sorry, but I'm going to be. But they're pretty romantic. depressed too. Well, that's what I was going to say. Is a true comedian is someone who writes their jokes. A true and rapper a tr and a true comedian, a rapper, and getting in, they also live very open. It's a lot yes. of candor, lots of candor. Yes. So so comedian rapper rock and roll music is is known for traditional right. rock and roll is known for creating their own sound yeah. versus poet versus the actor again this is this is a generalization but the actor the pop star they're kind of being told what to do mm -hmm. um, which is difficult too because it's then who am i right, right. who is my identity whereas right. the other one they're so so them perhaps that it's almost like this is just they're completely vulnerable versus the other one it's like so it seems like there's a there's a division between i wrote it down here tapping into your essence or whatever tapping into your creativity and being told what to do right well my experience with poets in general and one of the reasons i feel comfortable with them is again they don't hide well they don't really know how so in other words their dysfunctions are on full display you know, all the obsessive oh. behaviors, all of the uh, autistic sort of tendencies that might run around. Atypical behaviors. Atypical behaviors. And so uh, I really like that. I like, I like living with uh, being a part of that, uh, that group of people. Whereas in some other professions, uh, they're almost required to hide. Yes. You know what I mean? That's, that's one thing that I love about the the corporate zoom culture and how we had to retreat into our homes and do these work meetings. Meanwhile, our kids are in the background yelling and we were actually getting an insight to the humanness of our coworkers. And we've right? lost, and we, we've, and we've uh, lost a lot of our humanity in the process. And so maybe yes. it's a good thing that we retrieve some of that humanity. Like maybe not to the point where we find out that somebody's playing with himself, uh, <laughs> you know, below the camera, you know, that's, that's, no, that's, yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be a business meeting. The guy's whacking them. <laughs> Did yeah. that happen? Oh, I think it has happened. Yeah. I'm sure it happens. But I, I, yeah. I, yeah. I want to think, but no, I mean, uh, we really need to retrieve our humanity desperately across, the, across the globe. I think mm -hmm. technology in general, I think the industrialization of culture, but especially the, the electrification of culture, the digitization of culture, has really stolen a lot of our humanity and our ability to be human. It's too easy. People falsely believe there's distance between us, 
like when you go on these blogs and these horrible trolls that say these just evil things or the way that they like today is January 6th, the anniversary of, of uh, the, uh, the insurrection, probably the darkest day in our, in our democracy as far as I'm concerned. And it's dark, heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking and darker because the Republican party refuses to cop to what happened, obviously because a lot of them are guilty. Yeah. Uh, a, but, a, a majority of them. I mean, there yeah. are there are some again that they are resisting. Yeah, you know, they are the Invictus. That moment of. Yes. Have you seen the picture? Uh, they talk about it in the book Cast, and everybody's doing the sig high, but one man. Yeah, yeah, refuses to, and then we hear the story of what happened to him, and it's tragic. Yeah. Right. Well, but I mean, well, he refused. I, yeah. Well, that's wow. what I mean. It's like the guy in Tiananmen Square, the one guy that stood up, stopped the entire army, the Chinese army, because one man stood up to the tanks. That if anybody out. says that one man can't change the world, they've never heard about a guy who ate a bat. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but but oh, I understand. Yeah, but, yeah. But yeah. To get back to January 6th, I just want to say this: if if the election was false on the presidential level. Why wasn't the entire election false? So therefore, everybody, oh. everybody should have been. In other words, it's just it's bad for all. It's not just bad for the president of the United States and that that election. The, if 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 it's one if 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 on one level it's bad, the entire election is bad. So it's just bullshit. Yeah. And I don't understand how people cannot figure this out. It's simple logic. It's simple logic. If if the election was bad, it was bad. Period. Yeah. Not just for the president of the United States, but for all elected officials, for all everything on that, everything on that slate, start over again. But obviously it wasn't because it was according, right. according to all the election officials, it was probably the, maybe the safest, best election we ever had in the, in the history of this country. And the highest turnout. And the highest turnout. But yeah. this whole horse shit that oh it was stolen well then it was stolen on all levels not just on the top level so what the hell are we talking about but but just just on that though and 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 McLuhan talks about this and like I I don't know McLuhan so you know me me saying McLuhan talked about this I don't know what I'm talking about but from what I understand of McLuhan is that he talked about how in media and the, the the proliferation of it, it doesn't care about logic. It cares about emotions. Goebbels yes, talked about yes, that, yes, 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 right? Yes, Goebbels agree. said, don't appeal to logic, to reason, no. appeal to their emotions, make them feel scared. And that's how you begin to dehumanize somebody. You make them feel afraid, and then you tell them what they want to hear. That's exactly. That's exactly what Hitler did. Disease, and then offer the cure. Yes, exactly. Right? And that's where we're at right now. And it's a very dangerous place. It's a very, very dangerous place because as I talk with my friends about this stuff, there's nothing intellectual going on right now. It's all emotional. Hmm. It's all, it's all emotional. even, even, even in the intellectual spheres, right? Yeah, I mean, well, some, especially in the, in, some group in, thing. in a lot of the intellectual spheres, because those people too are basically promoting false ideas. It's all, I mean, there are very, a lot of really smart people that won't get vaccinated that are part yes. of the conspiracy that are on the other side saying the election was stolen. You know, come on, Ted Cruz supposedly went to Harvard. Oh, well, he's a, he's a performative artist, man. We, we've got to come to this. We've got to come right. to this moment. But, what, but, but what's he doing? He's jerking people off emotionally. Same yeah. thing with Ron DeSantis in Florida. I believe he, too, is a very supposedly a very, very educated man. You know what I mean? So when when are we going to say that politicians are artists and that artists have an obligation? Well, you know there there are examples of artists who have made it to the top. You know, not necessarily in this country. And I don't really. Hey, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor of California. Yeah, yeah, he was. <laughs> he was then Clint Eastwood was the mayor of uh, Carmel, I believe, or yeah, Carmel, and uh, and Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States, but. I wouldn't say that Ronald Reagan was president of the United States because he was uh, he was one of the greatest actors that ever lived. Well, he had an awful childhood too, and we know yeah. that adverse childhood experiences. I mean, you know, they we, sh we shall not uh, mention the presidential Voldemort, but yeah. uh, people become things, and that's why I want to tap into this Invictus poem because back to, back we can. We, but but like 
in our in our culture it's these triggers right like like we're trying to control our environment the world around us but not control ourselves and that that does worry me and well, it's like how do we find that moment where that invictus moment where that we realize that we are the masters of ourselves and we can pull ourselves up i can't expect people to get what i need from them i have to get what i need from myself or or ask for it like if you can help people help people if you need help ask for it but demanding it or making people cater to you that is a moment where it's like there has to be boundaries here and i think that one of the big issues that we're dealing with here is that we don't have boundaries work from home so many people they had 9 to 5 jobs their 9 to 5 jobs became 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. right we do have to navigate boundaries and that's internal and external well i think uh and again we can only speak in general terms really yes uh, and i think in western cultures because that's the only culture i would know or try to understand we are trained to to basically live anywhere but here and now we're also trained to not care for ourselves but to care for everything outside of ourselves as if we can control that so basically we don't really focus on ourselves we're not really told to love ourselves we're not told really we're told to better ourselves in the sense that you know look before you cross the street you know shower and shave yeah. basic things but we're not appearance really told, appearance yeah, appearance surface but we're not really told to heal ourselves and that is something that's really very new like go see a shrink and get the help you need or go to a therapist get the help you need you know address your personal ills not your physical ills but the psychic ills the emotional ills and emotionally just speaking for the united states we are really fucked up we are re we really we need to be on a psychiatrist's couch right now because we're basically we've, we've devolved into um it's a bunch of people across the board with their hands in the air all screaming me because they're in pain or they're afraid and hurt but nobody's saying us nobody's saying we need to get together not really you know what i mean it's all like these um i like identity politics especially has really split us apart really mm -hmm. split us apart badly i understand why people identify and we all do we all identify yes but if you don't have your focus on the greater good then uh really what ends up happening is we do become the house divided and as it's you know written a house balkanized divided, yeah a, a, a house divided cannot stand against itself yeah so we become ultimately horribly vulnerable because even on the left we're very divided there's no unified there's no unified voice really on the right there's a very unified voice which is why they end up being so powerful you know uh, i always say you uh, you go to a rally on the right for gun control it's all be it's basically they're all saying we want gun we you know we we want guns you go to a rally on the left and it's the anti everything rally yeah so it's the anti, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's, it's, there's no real unification. And well, nobody's listening and, I, and, and to each other. Like there's so much confirmation bias. You know, we could write a book about it, right. but it's like what, what we need to do is just stop, stop talking so much and, and listen more active listening, which is another thing that I hope to kind of demonstrate through this is I'm going to listen. I might not agree with everything. I did an interview with a guy you might dig. His name's William Gardner. And he's like, he's on the right, but he's with a libertarian, right? And uh, it's one of these conversations where, you know, we're trained to say, how could you say that? You know, but it's like, stop, listen, and reflect, right? right? Let's have a conversation because that's how you can't change a fanatic, right? Not, not saying this person was a fanatic or anything like that, but but you can't change you can't change a fanatic by telling them what to do sometimes you just got to listen and be their friend depending on what it is that they're saying well, the only way that you can find reason is to find commonalities exactly right? you have to find, find commonalities is you have to be able to talk and you have yeah. to be able to listen and again across across the board almost we have lost the ability to disagree dialogue and without the ability to listen you cannot disagree 
You know what I mean? And you must, we have to disagree. It sounds yes. stupid. It yeah. sounds contrary. But, but when two people are talking, they're not fighting. Well, but we, yes, we have to learn how to disagree with one another yeah. and come to a compromise because the democratic experiment, that's really what it's all about. It's not about one side's right and one side's wrong. It's about we're both right, we're both wrong. Let's find the commonalities yeah. so that we can govern together and govern peacefully. And I, again, I, I, um, I am not saying that people should not uh, be true to their own cause, but the greater cause of say, maybe let's save the planet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, something like that, because if we, and I do think not, and trust me, I'm not a tree hugging. I, I'm not out there going, I'm not doing the best I can. I'm doing my, yeah. my part as best I can. But if I was really living my, the true self to this cause, you know, I'd be like Greta Thunberg. I'd be out there saying, yeah. blah, 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 blah. You know, but if we don't save the planet, there's nothing. There's no, the yeah. planet doesn't care whether you're Republican or Democrat. It's guy, it guy, a guy doesn't give a shit. No, it doesn't at all. And the real revolution is this. The world's going to, the real revolution is when the world starts spitting our asses back out into space. That's the real revolution because it can't stand the disgusting taste yeah. of progress and politics any longer. Well, and, and when you look at the earth at night, you're just like, whoa, man, we are like a scourge on the earth. Like you see the lights at night, yeah, not yeah. to sound apocalyptic, but I mean, it does <laughs> look like a nasty infection. No, but we're on the verge, man. We are on the verge. We have reached a friction point on uh, uh, politically, ecologically, emotionally, spiritually. Mm -hmm. if we've just reached, we've reached a friction point on all levels. And if we don't turn around, we're not going to be able to, there is no going back. There's, I think a lot of people believe, or scientists believe, we really have already reached that point. We, we can't go back. You know, uh, we. it's fascinating that in 100 years, we've pretty much destroyed everything that took, from the beginning of time yes. up until the 19th, 20th century, we've destroyed everything in the, in the, in the 100 years since. It's just unbelievable. It's fascinating. That, that we've relied on. I mean, the reality is, is that if we were to wipe ourselves out, Obviously, I don't want that to happen, but the earth would, the earth reclaims well, the us earth all. Will recover. The earth, yes. the earth will recover. The earth will recover. It'll turn us into diamonds. You know, that, that's what, that's what. Or oil, happen. like it did the or dinosaurs. whatever the hell. But it will, it will, it will, it will do what it needs to do with all of us and everything that we've created. Yeah. In time, there'll be millions of years of crust on top of our asses and people will be looking through a telescope looking for life. So, to, to, to wrap it up, this <laughs> but but this this Invictus moment, this moment is what separated you from the crowd. Well, it separated me emotionally from the crowd, and it was very private. It yes. wasn't like, yeah. It wasn't like all of a sudden people go, "What happened to you? You look different today." You know, it was. But uh, that's performance. But, but okay, so a wonderful friend of mine, I quote him all the time. He talks about. The profound and, and, and the performative and generalizations again, to be sure, but profound, you don't say, oh my God, I've been changed, right? That's kind of right. performative, one right. might say. Right. It's just, it's within you and you know it. And yes. you've been, you, you know, based on what you've told me, it's like an Invictus moment. It's no, it like was, it just it was, makes sense to you. Yes, it was, profound, so, it was profound within me. Exactly. And, and it affected everything that came after it. Because like I said, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I wouldn't have uh, made many of the choices I made in my life because uh, what it did was it, it put me on the path to what you could call a personal recovery. Yes. Where it healed. It was like a bombing. It was a bomb. It was, and, it, and it's a process that lasts for an entire lifetime. You know what I mean? Healing uh, is forever. Healing is forever, and uh, and certainly I've I've made plenty of mistakes in my adult life and screwed up plenty for anybody, yeah. but hopefully I've learned and I've moved past those things in the sense that I've incorporated the mistakes so that I don't make them again, and I can probably help other people to to not make those missteps as well. Although we do all have to make our own mistakes. In in the movie. Saving Private Ryan, and I'm sorry for drawing such a heroic oh, yeah. Yeah, parallel tell, here. Tell me I'm a good person, yeah. 
so at this moment in your life and, and you still got lots of years left right because i just met you and i'm i'm greedy i want to keep you around <laughs> a long time but uh when you hear that poem invictus now and you think about your accomplishments and your failures right because you know i don't say we're losing i say we're learning but anyways in your process when you look back you know this poem what are your thoughts today are you just like yes yeah i was the captain uh of my life i was the captain as best i could be as uh, best as any captain can yeah, be. as best as any captain be it's it's i i try to always take responsibility for what i've done yes that's not really about the poem but could be um and that's difficult to do it's difficult to own everything it's easy to own the good stuff but i have to own all the bad stuff too and that's very hard because there are some things that I really don't like at all. You know, like the the hearts that I've broken, the way that I lied and cheated at some points in my life, especially with uh, with um, some, of, some of the women I was with. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest that uh, I thought that I was above the dysfunction, but I wasn't. You know what I mean? Because I was a case of raging hormones and I didn't, everything that I, as a child and a teenager, looked around me and I said, I, did, I don't ever want to repeat these things. Mm. I'm no different than most other people. I ended up repeating a lot of it. Yeah. Because it's basically, it's familiar. It's imprinted behavior in a lot of ways because it's the, it's the, uh, the Bible that was given to me. Yeah. And I had to break those commandments in order to uh, live my own. Well, it's the default right what you observe what you experience can yes, be the exactly. default because it's it's an ironic thing but that's what i thought trust was because that's what was taught to me people breaking trust was the only trust i understood and so i had to un unfortunately i had to play that out to understand how precious and how fragile and how powerful trust really is. Yeah. Me too, and, man. Yeah, you know, and it's uh, unfortunately it's typical of uh, abusive backgrounds to play that out. Fortunately, I um, I figured it out before I really did something really stupid and really, really, truly horrible. You know what I mean? Uh, and um, and here I am. You know, uh, maybe. Uh, certainly better for this poem and that's for sure because again it it it, it wasn't it, i would have been I, I i i couldn't have had anything but a creative life because it's just what was in the cards for me i've always been a creative person you know as a child during that period of time um most of my life after everybody went to sleep i would be up all night long drawing Mm. or writing so during my entire teen years that's what I, nobody knew it but that's what i was doing you know um and then doing it during my waking hours as well uh, what's supposed to be my waking hours yeah but you know so i would have always had a creative life but this poem uh changed my personal life i wouldn't say it changed my creative life as much as it changed my personal life changed my creative life because i became committed to the poem but really was more important to me personally than it was creatively and 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 perhaps this is a speculative question um but the creative is like an escape right you're escaping from this oh no, creative creative isn't just an escape no creative is a way of life right creative is a away way of from life. away from the reality but it was it was no 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 creative yeah. is a way of life yeah creative is what i creative is what i'm designed to be and do that's yeah. no differently than if I was a doctor or I was a teacher. Right. This is your calling. This is my, you could argue the yeah. creative way of life was a calling for me. I've been very lucky that I've had a creative life, but it was the only life that I was going to have. Right. And I made it happen deliberately. As inspiration from this poem, this poem. No, not, no, not just the poem. The poem yeah. again. The poem again altered my personal life. Yes. This poem. Yeah. This poem. Poetry in general is part of my greater creative life. Right. But 
I patronize myself as a poet through my work as an actor. So Patron act, acting is my profession. I've been yes. an actor all my life. Yeah. I did pretty good, did all right. Had a yeah. career in spite of myself, I had a career. So as an actor, you know, supporting myself, supporting other people too. I've patronized, I've published people, I've paid for road trips, you know, all kinds of stuff, supported my ex-wife and my son, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I did well enough that I could do all those things, but I patronized myself as a poet. So I protected myself, so to speak. I, 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 I elevated myself uh, as a poet, so to speak, uh, I'm, I don't want to be too precious and all this, but uh, through uh, through my work as an actor. And when I was young, the people that inspired me were people like uh, Wallace Stevens and um, 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 and uh, John Cassavetes, and I can't think of his name right now, who wrote, uh, uh, oh, I'll think of his name in a minute. But uh, these people all, they all did the same exact thing. You know, Wallace Stevens sold insurance. William Carlos Williams was a doctor. Right. John Cassavetes was an actor who patronized his work as a director. You know what I mean? These people all did things uh, professionally to support so make, to support what they did creatively, and I and I've deliberately done the same thing. Well, that's awesome. Essay, I I, I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, there there is a. A, a great paradox here, a common paradox that I say, oh, we're just going to go for 15, 20 minutes and it ends uh, up 45. So I hope I have a bored people too much. The other person I was trying to think of was Charles Ives. Charles Ives, the poet. No, Charles Ives, the composer. Yeah. Charles Ives was one of the great composers of the 20th century. And I, I believe he too sold insurance. And he had written all this music that never got published. He's one of the greatest composers of the 20th century. And now it's been discovered after his well, passing. Well, it was, I believe some of it was being published while he was alive, but he didn't really, the point was he wrote it because he had to. He wrote it because he needed to. There was a compel, he was compelled to. He was to. compelled to do this stuff, but he was able to do this because he was doing something else to pay the rent and feed himself. He didn't wait for somebody I else. I know that. I, I, I know that far too well. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. the point is, is, you don't wait for somebody to do it for you. You do it for yourself. Yes. You don't sit around going, oh, woe is me. Come come help me so that I can be a creative, wonderful person. Yeah. You take care of it yourself. That's what Invictus also told me too. The same exact thing. Go out and do it, man. Don't yeah. wait for somebody else to do it. You you go out and do it. Yeah. You can't so, wait for inspiration to come to you, you know. Well, it's not it's not inspiration necessarily. You need to be practical. Put wheels on the fucking cart. Don't look at the cart and go, where are the wheels? Put the wheels on it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And make it happen. Make it make, happen. Take some ownership of your, well, you, you've said well, that before, responsibility. I mean, one of the things I did too was uh, in 2003, just before we marched into Operation Desert Forever mm -hmm. in Afghanistan and Iraq. Desert. Operation that's Desert Forever. That's, that's a better name, I think, than the, yeah. the operation itself. Um, and so... Uh, a friend of mine from the punk days, she owned a billboard. She was in control of this billboard at one of the busiest street corners in Los Angeles. And, um, and so uh, she said, do you want to put a poem on this billboard? And I said, whoa, that's pretty cool. Sure. Uh, why not? And so, um, so uh, that's a big one, man. Uh, like, you know, uh, what do you put on a billboard? You know what I mean? For the whole world to see. And so, um, and so I uh, put a poem up there. I'm gonna pull it up for you because it's a short poem. And, um, and so it, uh, this, is, this is the corner of Sunset Boulevard, Hillhurst and Vermont. And it's, uh, and it's really one of the busy street corners in all of Los Angeles. So this is the poem here. It's called, I choose not to believe in war, holy or not. So the title is, I choose not to believe in war, holy or not. If I were Christ, I would be a drink of water. If I were Buddha, I would gladly kill myself in the garden of your eyes forever. If I were Muhammad, Mecca would be the journey in your touch. If I were a Jew, the Holy Land would be the covenant of my blood singing Hosanna in your veins. 
If I were an atheist, I would call your every footfall God, leaving footprints in the moment. So that was on a billboard for about three weeks. And uh, I would go and sit at the street corner and just, because people had to see it because of the stoplights. And I would just look at people just craning up and looking at the poem and reading it. And for me, what was important about that was, generally speaking as poets, we only speak to each other. We're only speaking to the choir. Bit of a closed circuit. It pretty much is. You know, who, who buys poetry except pretty much, for the most part, other poets? I needed to get, I want to speak beyond the choir. Mm -hmm. I want to speak to the unconverted. I want to speak to the people that really need to hear the poem and experience the poem. You want to prophetize uh, poetry. Well, a little bit. More than that. Yeah. It's not just proselytize, but I want to be part of the conversation. Yeah. Living art. With living art. So I want this to be part of the, like Guernica was part of the conversation. You know, like like other things have been part of the conversation. It's not It's not like literally proselytizing. It's like saying, look, here's where we're going. Are you thinking about what we're doing? Are you really thinking about this and why? If war is holy, well, here's my opinion. I don't believe war is holy. I just don't. Love. So the, the opening line is, if I were Christ, I'd be a drink of water. You know, I wouldn't be right. a bomb. I'd be a drink of water. So anyway. That I, was well, it, it, it was telling me love. I mean, I know it sounds cheesy and corny. No, but ultimately that's what it is. It's, it's, it's yeah. a love for your fellow. But, the, but, but, but those are, and, and this is, I think, what's so cool about poetry is like, these aren't just words. The whole thing evokes something. And it's yeah. like, when I say, love is the answer like those are just words yeah but to right. know that that well, is profound and you can't just say love is you know what i mean like how do you, something... but, how, but how do you know it how do you know it i did i just have felt it no you i look to, up no you have to practice ah everything, yes absolutely everything you're, you're absolutely right i agree with that everything is practice and boy yeah. that's really hard to practice every day what you preach is really hard to do very difficult because it's really easy to make as we've done all this time, make sweeping generalizations, but to, but to basically say, oh yeah, the answer is love. That doesn't do anything. The yeah. practice of love, getting back to Greta Thunberg, she loves the planet. She's practicing and she's hoping the rest of us through her practice will practice with her because if we don't, it's over. So to practice love is what it's about. And boy, that's really, that's, that's the whole ball. That's Invictus right there, man. You have, it is. Get up, keep practicing. Your head is bloodied, but keep I'm about going. Yeah, unbat. I love that word. Yeah, it practice practices practices the whole gig, and pro that's what process is. Process is practice, and practice is all we got. Process. We don't results come and go. They mm. everything's result. Keep moving because you you can't play the result. If you play the result, you will alter the practice. I love it. Essay. Thank you. Well, thank you, man. And again, I hope I'm not too full of shit. <laughs> I, well, like, trust me, I got plenty of it. I got lots where that came from. Me too. But that's why I enjoy talking to you. So well, thanks, man, because we're both full of it. Okay, great. <laughs> but maybe, me, you know, full of shit. I, I, I'd rather be full of shit then. If that's what this is. Plant a flower on my head. Great fertilizer. <laughs>